from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. If you've been out sailing much or boating of any kind, every now and then you see whales. Not too often, I've raced along the coast. One time, one sail, sail alongside of us for like, you know, 30 seconds, 20 seconds maybe, going down to Southern California during a race. We were going like 15, 14, 15 knots. And he stayed right with us, kind of like a companion, about two lengths on the starboard side, just west of us. And I've seen him uh, surface in front of us, even in the bay several times during races. Once my young daughter said to me in Raccoon Straits, Dad, look, well, right ahead of us. And sure enough, Three links in front of us, there was a whale kind of crossing our path. But there are some scientists who are learning about whales by listening to them. Our guest today is Ann Simonis, PhD, an acoustic biologist with the National Maritime Fisheries Service. She's an acoustic ecologist. You'll say, what? Did you say acoustic ecologist? Yes, with NOAA's Southwest Fisheries Science Center, an adjunct professor of biology at my alma mater, San Francisco State. So Ann, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. What an incredibly fun field and a fascinating field. Tell us, how is it that you use acoustic recorders that drift in offshore waters and the California current to study whales and dolphins and human activities? It's great to be here with you all. As an acoustic ecologist, well, first of all, as an ecologist, my job is to look for patterns in nature. And I'm really focused on whales and dolphins. And the way that I look for patterns in their behavior is by collecting sounds they make. Uh, we find that some species are easier to hear than they are to see. So acoustic recordings are a great way to get a window into their lives. So let me ask a few questions about the beginnings of your aquatic life. When was the first time you were on a boat? What kind of boat was it or where? Well, I grew up in central Wisconsin, small town. So, you know, the, my first experiences on the water were in the lakes and rivers around central Wisconsin. I remember being on my grandpa's fishing boat, which was probably the first time and having to sit very quietly and not make any sounds because we didn't want to scare the fish. Um, wait, wait, we have to just stop and listen to the irony of that amazing early lesson. <laughs> Be quiet to not make any sounds to scare the fish. And you're an acoustic ecologist listening constantly to the sounds of, of sea creatures. Unbelievably fun. Okay, so there you are with your grandfather. What kind of boat was this? It was, I don't even know. It was just a little um, aluminum. It was just a little John boat uh, is what we called it. And so tell us, uh, and how did your education evolve? What did you get your bachelor's in and where? Well, I'll back up just a little bit before my bachelor's because I had a really amazing public high school experience where I got paired up with active researchers in Wisconsin who were studying mainly timber wolves, but also white-tailed deer and coyotes. Dick Beal was a researcher with the Department of Natural Resources who I worked with. I, I think I was like most, so many kids, I got, I was fascinated with whales and dolphins, but I, in Wisconsin, I didn't have any opportunities to study those animals, but I had this opportunity to work with Dick Thiel and study these wolves and deer, and I would go out in the field uh, every other week and snap on my snowshoes and track the animals through the woods, and some of them had radio collars, and we could track the, the movement of the animals, and um, I got to learn what a career in wildlife science actually actually would feel like. And I loved it. I loved being out in the woods. I loved learning about the animal behavior and, and their movements throughout the seasons. And I find now um, that a lot of those techniques I learned as a high school student, I'm, I'm actually using today. But after high school, I went on, I got my general, um, uh, my undergraduate degree in just general ecology. Uh, and Where? I went to that was from Minnesota State University in Mankato. And I also did a year of my school at Deakin University in Warrnambool, Australia. That's where I got my first real taste of acoustics with, with whales. Um, and then um, I took some time off in between my under, undergraduate and graduate school. I was traveling around Australia and sailing to the Galapagos Islands. And then eventually I learned that I wanted to go back to a career in science. I thought it was really important. So I went to do my PhD at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla in Southern California. Wonderful, wonderful. What kind of boat did you sail in Australia 
There were a variety of vessels. I was working on some fishing vessels to collect acoustic data. And then I actually was with the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society and we sailed from Melbourne to the Galapagos. Wonderful. Great, great shot. How many people on the boat? How long was the boat? The Farley Mowat was, I forget exactly how long it is. There were, I think, about 22 or 23 of us on the crew. I was navigating as we were crossing the Pacific. Can you handle old-fashioned things like a sextant? You had to shoot a star? I did learn how to do that when we were out. I, um, I haven't had a chance to practice that much since... We pulled into the Galapagos, but it was it was a fabulous experience. So as sailors, I, I do really hope you've had the opportunity to spend some time with the whales that frequent our coastal waters. Uh, I suspect a few of you can probably name some of the common species. Um, maybe you've seen humpback whales just outside the Golden Gate, or it's possible you've seen gray whales as they're migrating either from Alaska down to the lagoons in Mexico, or right now the gray whales are migrating up the coast from Mexico up to Alaska. Maybe you've seen them. And as Ron was describing before, you know, these encounters with whales can be really exciting, memorable events. Um, and they often induce this, this beautiful feeling of awe, which I think has um, inherent value. Um, you know, these experiences can make us happier and healthier as we move throughout the world. But I want to take a moment to also remind you that beyond these wonderful feelings that the animals can give us, top level consumers, predators like whales and dolphins are really important to ecosystems. So whether we're on land or in the ocean, the well-being of these predators has a big impact on, on the rest of the, the ecosystem around them. And there's been plenty of research that removing uh, top predators like whales or dolphins or wolves can have a cascading effect throughout the ecosystem. Now, I, have you heard about how uh, sea otters are critical for healthy kelp forests? One of these scenarios, have you heard about sea otters and how they're critical for healthy kelp forests? Recently, cruising up the California Delta, I saw what seemed like beavers, but they were, I've never seen so many. And they were like three feet long and they were big. And they were on the Sacramento River near Locke. And I couldn't believe how many I saw. I've sailed up there for literally 60 years and I've never seen this many. And I know they're important. Yeah, so I just want to touch on this fast example. Um, and it's, it's great that you're seeing some of these animals recovering. Um, and I, I think there was actually a previous lunchtime seminar that discussed sea otters and how they're critical for healthy kelp forests. If you're not familiar with it, let me just give you a quick overview because uh, I think it's a great example. So uh, sea otters live in cold water environments and they have a really high metabolism to, to keep warm. And one of the main prey items they eat are, is sea urchins. And in places where sea otters have been removed uh, through hunting, either or kill, they've maybe been hunted by killer whales or humans, the population of sea urchins will explode because there are no longer sea otters to keep them under control. And when the population of sea urchins explodes, then the sea urchins eat the kelp and destroy the kelp forests. But in places where we have healthy sea otter populations, they keep the sea urchin populations in check. And then we have thriving kelp forests, which are really important habitat for a variety of other fish and invertebrate species. So this is just one example of how removing a predator from the ecosystem can have these cascading effects. We can even take a, a step back. Um, just I want to put a little more perspective on why it's important to take, take care of these predators and what's happening in our oceans. Thousands of years, humans have been removing animals and fundamentally changing the terrestrial landscapes around us, right? Removing entire ecosystems and, and causing mass extinctions. But in contrast, the physical properties of our oceans have limited our ability to explore and extract resources in the same way. But in the last hundred years or so, the pace that we're exploiting the oceans has accelerated through the use of industrial fishing um, and the rapid expansion of, of coastal populations everywhere. The hope is that we can learn from these past lessons on land and prevent the wide scale of collapse of these diverse and productive marine ecosystems that truly nourish us. Um, and it really might not be too late to save these 
big marine predators in the ecosystem, ocean ecosystems. But in order to protect them, we need to understand their behavior. That's where my work comes into play. The ocean can be a really dark place. Any light that goes through the surface is quickly absorbed or scattered by the water molecules. But sound travels really well through the ocean. And many of the sounds made by animals, humans, and other natural sources can be recognized by their acoustic signature. And animals like dolphins and many whales are great candidates for acoustic monitoring because they generate distinct sounds depending on their species. And some of these sounds can be attributed to different behaviors like navigating or finding food or communicating. Now for dolphins to navigate and find food, they use their own natural form of, of sonar. They emit a series of clicks called echolocation clicks. They're generated within their head and they're sent out into the world, much in the same way that we use a flashlight to look around a dark room, dolphins can use this beam of sound to illuminate the underwater world. So they're listening for the returning echoes from these clicks to, to find food or navigate. And so I'll play an example of some echolocation clicks here. They're just very small tapping sort of sounds. And this ability to echolocate evolved you know, 30 million years ago. It's really evolved to become the primary sense that dolphins use to get through their life. And this, this ability to echolocate is really critical for dolphin survival. It's allowed them to, along with the ability to, to hold their breath and dive deeply, it allows them to access food in deep water where there might not be as much competition from other species. Echolocation clicks aren't the only sounds that uh, dolphins are making. They also use other signals to communicate with each other, including whistles. And so the burst pulses sound, um, they're also used for communication, but these sound more like um, when someone's blowing raspberries. They're, they're a different sort of sound. All right, so when we're studying acoustics, we humans find it very useful to have a visualization of the sound because we are such visual creatures. And so I use a tool called a spectrogram in so much of my research. So I wanna just share an example of it and describe what a spectrogram is here because you'll see a few other uh, examples of spectrograms throughout my talk. So I in this- Echolocation, clicks, whistles, and bursts are, are the clicks by dolphins and the whistles by whales and the purse, bulls purse by other animals? Or are these different forms of sound communication used by the same species? Uh, great questions. The larger whales, the baleen whales, or blue whales, humpback whales, gray whales, they do not echolocate as far as we know. It's the dolphins and sperm whales and, and any of the, the whales with teeth that rely on echolocation. And the whistles and burst pulses are also really characteristic of, of the whales that have teeth, not baleen. Which of these three forms of communication do dolphins use and which do whales use? If we just split, split between dolphins and whales, dolphins echolocate and use whistles and whales use other calls. The graphic shows that we can only hear the lower frequency audio. That's correct. When we're born, the limit of our hearing range is up to 20 kilohertz. And as we age, that decreases, you know, depending on how many rock concerts you, you go to. And there are all sorts of different things that can damage your hearing. But yeah, we can only hear up to a max of about 20 kilohertz. But you'll notice that my vertical axis goes up to 100 kilohertz. So this vertical axis is the, the pitch or the frequency of the sound. And the, a lot of the dolphins are making signals that extend way above our hearing range. That's another reason why this spectrogram is so valuable for me because I can visualize sound that I can't hear. Mm -hmm. And so on, on the spectrogram, we have pitch or frequency on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. So here we're looking at an hour of acoustic recordings and all of these bright lines up above about 20 kilohertz are dolphin echolocation clicks. And you can probably see some little squig squiggles and dots sort of 
around 10 or 20 kilohertz, and those are the burst pulses and whistles. So now there are many different ways of collecting sound in the ocean, and the way that you collect the sound is really going to depend on a variety of things. Your question, first of all, and how much money and time you have. And any time we're collecting data, there's always this trade-off between space and time. So historically, we've used large ship-based surveys to study whale and dolphin populations. And we can take a big NOAA ship and survey a huge region, the entire U.S. West Coast, and we'll get really good spatial coverage. But we're only in any one point for just a snapshot in time. So we have really poor resolution in time. Now, the you also could just put an instrument on the seafloor. And here's a recording package that I used a lot when I was at Scripps as a graduate student. You can have one instrument, say, in one spot on the seafloor, and that can record for a really long time. So you get excellent temporal coverage, but you're really only going on in that one spot. How long can that seafloor moored device record? Is it battery operated? How long does it last? Yeah, they rely on batteries and it, it depends, but we can leave them out for up to a year at a time. It depends on the type of batteries and how many hard drives you have in and what kinds of sounds you want to record. If you want to capture okay. everything, you're limited in the time that you can stay out there. What is the price range for one of those seafloor mounted uh, recording devices? They can be twenty dollars to $40,000. Okay. And the drifting buoy rig, what's that cost? So that's an intermediate. Those are costing us about $15,000. But both of those compare favorably to the operating costs of a big NOAA ship, don't they? Exactly. Yeah. We really don't have funds to do those large scale surveys often. So we're relying on these other methods to collect data in the time in between those big surveys. I want to let you know what sort of the driving force behind my research is these days. There's a big push toward developing uh, more renewable energy and offshore wind farms will soon be installed along the coast of California. The map on the lower right here shows the planned wind farm areas off of Northern California, around Humboldt, and then off of Morro Bay. And so a big question for scientists in the management community is how can we monitor, manage, and mitigate the impacts associated with the wind farm development on our oceans. Are these going to be mounted, uh, anchored to the sea, or are they going to be floating? These will be floating offshore in deep, deep waters. And they'll have motors to keep them in position or anchor line, anchor chain? They will be anchored. How deep are they anchored? How, what kind of how depth of water do you know? Don't know the depths off the top of my head, but they're on the order of 20 to 30 miles offshore. The primary way that I'm collecting acoustic recordings to study what's, what's going to be going on around these wind farms are through these drifting buoys. We really like these drifting buoys because they have sort of a balance between that temporal and spatial coverage. We can get into these far deep water environments, and they're a lot more affordable than the large scale surveys. And we've also designed these buoys so they're fairly easy to deploy. So I have a diagram of the buoy on the right, and we have an aluminum pole, which is about nine feet tall. We have a radar reflector at the top so that ships know that it's in the water and hopefully avoid hitting it. And then we have a couple of surface floats underneath which we have 100 meters of line at the bottom, there's a, an anchor to keep it vertical, and there's an acoustic recorder and some underwater microphones. They're called hydrophones at depth. These can be deployed. You see me here on the back of a ship. I just deploy the pole in the water and I'm lowering the surface float in, and we can send these out with um, non-experts. We've sent them out with fishermen and with other scientists who are gonna be on the water anyway. And I don't actually have to go out to deploy or recover the buoys because they're pretty easy to handle. They're not quite small enough, I think, for a, a sailboat in a race to take them out because they have some weight and some space that they take up, but they are pretty to, easy to deploy and recover if you're not in a hurry. Current rig, how heavy are the anchors? What depth of water are you usually putting this out there? We try and have them in, in water deeper than 200 meters so that we don't risk them running aground. How long do you deploy these? How long are they in the water? They can be out from anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. And currently you have your own ships that come and put them in location and, and then retrieve them? Yeah, so there's we've been working with a variety of, 
of different platforms. We do use NOAA vessels to deploy and recover them. So we were working with fishermen out of Bodega Bay, Dick Ogg, and he and his crew really helped us refine the design of these buoys. And then they've been really instrumental in going out to deploy some and recover them for us. My colleague Shannon Rankin wrote a blog about this collaboration. That QR code will take you to that blog post if you want to read more about it. But we're very interested in, in partnering with other folks to collect this kind of data. For this type of research, collecting long-term data is really essential. Uh, NOAA started collecting acoustic data with these drifting buoys in 2016. And I show a map on the left of the tracks of the buoys from 2016. And then there was another large scale survey in 2018 where we had more buoys collected. And now in recent years, the scale has, has condensed a little bit. We're really focusing on the areas around those wind call areas, but there will be future surveys which are trying to get out to those farther offshore regions again in the next year or so. Collecting data in these long time periods is really critical if you want to start to de detect trends. You know, if we only had one of these surveys, we wouldn't know nearly as much as we do when we continue to collect the same data for many years at a time. Let me see if I understand. These little wiggly worm-shaped lines are the tracker path of an acoustic buoy, each of those an individual buoy that you deployed in 2016, 18, and recently. Yes, that's right. And why are you more interested in closer to shore research lately? The tracks are more centralized in the recent years around Northern California, Humboldt Bay, and around San Francisco Bay, because we're really interested in those wind farm areas. The recordings that have been collected along all of these tracks are going to be useful for tracking human activity, the large whales, dolphins, porpoises, you know, a variety of species. They're really, really valuable for um, getting to these offshore areas and for studying animals that are, are difficult to see. And because you want to know what's happening with animals before the wind farms go in, so you That's can right. compare, measure any change caused by the wind farms. If I got that right? Yes, yes. The beauty of these data sets is that we are going to have a baseline to compare once the wind farms um, start being constructed and become operational. Recently, the crab fishermen have been affected by restrictions in the season caused because whales have been tangled up in crab nets. How does the testing equipment that you've been deploying compare in terms of tangling up, crab, uh, tangling up the whales? How does it not tangle up the whales, I hope? So the drifting buoys that we use are deployed in deeper offshore waters, and they're not in, in areas where there's a high density of whales who are actively feeding. They're also not anchored to the ground so they can move out of the way. And something that I, I know there's a lot of interest in for the crab fishery is there's ropeless gear that's being developed where you can have the crab pot on the seafloor and not have to have the buoy at the surface. There are a lot of you probably are familiar with our humpback whales or our gray whales, but I would be willing to bet that very few of you have seen the whale shown in this slide. And this is a, a mother and calf pair of Cuvier's beaked whales. Now, most people will never see a beaked whale in their life, but there are 23 different species of beaked whales, nine of which we know live along the U.S. West Coast. And these Cuvier's beaked whales, which I'm showing here, are the most common beaked whale along the California current, but they're still an incredibly rare whale to see. If you've never heard about beaked whales before, you're not alone. I like to describe them as really weird, big, toothless dolphins. They're not dolphins, but they sort of have the same body shape as a dolphin, but they're big. The females don't have any teeth, so they suction feed Squid. They've evolved to become the world's deepest diving mammals to access the deep water squid. They are capable of foraging over a thousand meters. The record is actually like around 3,000 meters, and they stay down uh, for over an hour at a time. So they're in really deep water for these really long dives, and they tend to avoid human activity. So they're basically impossible to see. Some of these species have only ever been described from dead animals that have shown up on the beaches. And so at this point, 
you should be asking, how do you study a rare animal that's basically impossible to see? That's where I come in. So this is what I, I spent a lot of my time in graduate school studying. I think everyone who's listening here today is, is probably an acoustic ecologist in some capacity. You each can recognize some animals based on the sounds that they make. For sure, you can recognize a cat or a dog. And maybe you can even recognize different behavioral states of those animals. But just like people can learn to recognize the different species of, of land animals, I've been learning to recognize the different sounds of underwater animals. And there are some species that have really distinct characteristics attached to the sounds that they make. And so when I was at Scripps, I was working with my advisor, Dr. Simone Bauman Pickering, and we described the echolocation clicks that are distinct for about a dozen beaked whale species. And I just have a grid that I'm showing and the details are not important, but each one of these represent a distinct beaked whale click that we've identified. And some of them are attached to known species like the Cuvier's beaked whales. Um, the patterns of the scratches on their backs are from teeth of the males. So only the males have teeth and they Mostly they only have one or two teeth and thought that that's like, those are battle scars from the male. Mainly the animals with the most scratches are males. So it's, it's believed to be sort of a male competition behavior. Are these particular, these are beaked whales? Yes, these are Cuvier's beaked whales. These, uh, they actually were pretty close to the boat I was on in the Channel Islands. So I got this fabulous photo, which is- These are really rare creatures. Really highly unusual. So we've been able to describe some of their click types, we know what Cuvier's beaked whale clicks sound like, and we know what Baird's beaked whales sound like. But we also discovered a collection of clicks that we have no idea which species was making them. Definitely looked like beaked whale clicks, but they're mysteries on who is making them. I'll tell you a little bit more about some of these mysteries because um, I think they're fun to explore. Now that we know what Cuvier's beaked whales sound like, oh, by the way, the clicks of Cuvier's beaked whales far above our hearing range. We cannot actually hear them. So we have to use these automated detectors to, to find them. And those spectrograms come in really handy. Now I want to show you where I've been finding them. So the waters offshore San Francisco Bay and these outlines show our sanctuaries, Cordell Bank, the Greater Farallons and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And we've had researchers going out to do surveys regularly in the summer since 1987. And historically, these surveys rely on visual observations from marine mammals. We recently started working with them to deploy some of these drifting recorders, but in over the 30 years of visual surveys they've done, there has not been a single observation of a beaked whale. Now, the map on the right shows the paths of a couple of drifters that we deployed in 2021. Here's one up in the northern section, and that went through some fairly shallow water between 100 and 900 meters, and that's not really where beaked whales tend to be. They like the deeper water. And this drift on the southern region went through some prime beaked whale habitat. And sure enough, we had a number of Cuvier's beaked whale detections, which are shown in these pink dots along the drift. Those ray dots are showing some clicks that were definitely beaked whale clicks, but the signal quality was not high enough for me to say for sure that they were Cuvier's beaked whales. They could have been, but they could have been a different species as well. So yeah, it's just exciting that in you know, one drift in a couple of weeks of effort, we were able to learn so much more about these species that had never been sighted in the offshore waters of San Francisco before. So it really highlights the importance of including acoustic monitoring, especially for these species that are hard to see. I call beaked whales visually cryptic because they're just almost impossible to see. Okay, so let's talk about a really exciting discovery that came from the same way of collecting data. So the map I'm showing on the upper left shows all the drifts that we collected in 2018. And I'm showing these three different mystery beaked whale signals. Yellow dots are a signal we call BW43. The pink is the BW37V, no idea who this is. And the green are BWC. So these are all mystery beaked whale species. And what we noticed is that there was a hot spot of these yellow BW43 click detections off of Baja, California. And after we identified this hot spot, my colleague, Jay Barlow, who is now retired, but he had uh, some extra time and he paired up actually with Sea Shepherd 
on their uh, sailboat, the Martin Sheen, and they went down to see if they could visually confirm which animal was making this mystery signal type. And they got lucky. They came across a pair of beaked whales. They were able to get some underwater photos. You see the photo of the animals on the left. And then when they came up to the surface, they had one of our buoys in the water and they were able to collect some acoustic recordings. And when they analyzed these photos and analyzed the sounds that came from these recordings, they were totally shocked because it didn't sound like BW43. It wasn't that mystery sound we were looking for. And the photos didn't look like any beaked whale that had ever been seen dead or alive ever before. So what we think has happened is that they discovered an entirely new species of beaked whale just by going down and looking for this, this unknown signal type. So I think it's incredible that we're still discovering large species of whales in the ocean today. You would have thought that we would have found them all, but there have been multiple discoveries of new beaked whale species in the last few years, really, and partly driven by acoustics. There are humans who are the same species, but who speak three different languages on the surface, but we're, we're the same species. How is it that the beaked whales would have different species just based upon their different sound signature? We know that individual beaked whale species use very distinct click types for each, each species. So we know that their click types are a pretty reliable way to separate them. But in this case, the defining characteristics that tell us that we think this is a new species come from the photographs and from analyzing the shape of the body and the markings on the body. It's unlike any animal that has ever been seen before. So now there's a, a similar fun discovery that was made. Besides those BW43 signals off of Baja, we noticed up off of Oregon and Washington, we had quite a few of these BW37V, these other mystery beaked whale species. So Jay, again, went up on a mission to go and track them down. On this occasion, he had there was a really long encounter with beaked whales in the area. And I can play this video and we'll see if this video comes through. And you can actually see how difficult it is to see beaked whales at the surface of the water. The exciting thing about this one is that Jay and the, the colleagues from Oregon State University were able to collect some genetic information along with a big collection of photos and videos. And this animal actually matches with a, a species that we have seen a few times before, which is Hub's beaked whale. And so now we know whenever we hear this mystery beaked whale, well, this beaked whale signal, which used to be a mystery, BW37B, we now know that those are actually Hub's beaked whales. And so we can go back into our archive of recordings and say, okay, where was that signal? Okay, those were all Hub's beaked whales. And we're learning so much more about the species now that we can connect the sound to the species. There are still so many mysteries that remain in the ocean. We still have this BWC signal that we detected off of Baja. And actually, when I was a graduate student, we detected uh, that signal all throughout the Pacific. And these green dots show the different places where it's been detected. Based on the, the range of its where we're detecting the sound, we think it could potentially be the ginkgo toothed beaked whale because a ginkgo toothed beaked whale is known from strandings and some different sightings uh, throughout this range, but we've never seen the whale and recorded the sound at the same time. So we still don't know for sure that this is the whale making that sound. So that's a mystery left to, to solve. So at the beginning of our talk, I mentioned that as a high school student, I was connected with active researchers and I learned about wildlife science. And I am thrilled to be able to do that in turn myself now that I'm an active researcher. So I've been working with high school students for many years. And one student I'm working with now is from Oakland, Alexandra Fisk. 
And it's really a little known secret that high school students can produce high quality research when they have the right support. And so supporting these students and watching them grow is the best part of my job. And not only is it fun to see them develop as scientists, but I actually get to do a lot more research than I'd ever get to do on my own when I recruit them to help. So I trained Alexandra to recognize the echolocation clicks of Pacific white-sided dolphins, which are shown here. The map on the left shows a combination of visual sightings and acoustic detections of Pacific white-sided dolphins in the, the pink and the, the red marks. Alexandra pulled um, historic sightings of this species dating back to 1995 to 2005. All the gray dots are sightings of this species over the past, and the red and the pink are the detections from 2018. And what she noticed is that the animals were really concentrated in the Northern California current. There was only one detection south of Point Conception. A couple little dots down there, but really they had usually been found south of Point Conception, but in 2018, they just weren't occupying that space at all. And she found that the dolphins were really trying to track waters that were 13 to 14 degrees Celsius, and all of that cool water had shifted northward. And so now we're really interested to see uh, since then, if the dolphins will return to their historic range, or if we're seeing a northward range shift that's associated with the warming oceans. We just started seeing dolphins in the bay, literally like in the 2000s. And sailors will tell you that obviously a dolphin is altogether different than a seal, but we didn't see dolphins before, but we've been seeing them lately. And it's kind of amazing to us to say, all of a sudden there's, all, there's dolphins. San Francisco Bay. And are you telling me that you're tracking a similarly, well, in this case, northerly shift? You used to see them in Southern California, but now we do see them in Northern California. And you're giving me some scientific evidence that they weren't here before, but they are here now. That's right. Yes, we are seeing that acoustically. I know other researchers have been documenting that as well. Uh, Bill Keener just published a paper about this, about the bottlenose dolphins moving up into the bay. So yes, it is happening. You're I'm, I'm sure that if the dolphins would have been there, you would have noticed them before. Beyond just including high school students in our research, I'm really excited about providing acoustic recordings to everyone. I love listening to underwater recordings. I love hearing all the weird, unusual sounds of the ocean, and I think everyone should be able to do that. So I'm working on uh, developing a new citizen science project called Ocean Voices, which is on the Zooniverse website. It's not live at the moment, but I'm hoping it's gonna be live in, in the weeks to come. And I'm uploading small clips of our acoustic data and presenting a spectrogram, which now you know what a spectrogram is. And we have some tools on there to train people how to recognize different sounds. And we're hoping to recruit people to help us label all of these sounds so that we can do more with all the data we're collecting. You know, humans are so good at finding patterns and recognizing weird sounds that I want to recruit people to help me label the data, and then we can train computers based on the, the labels our citizen scientists provide so that our computers can go through and automatically recognize some of these. So Zooniverse is one of the first, and I'd say one of the best, citizen science websites. So different researchers can upload their data and recruit citizen scientists to label their data. Some people are uploading photos or uh, originally people were looking at images from telescopes and looking for galaxies or you know different different signals from different stars or black holes. And so there's a variety of different kinds of research projects on Zooniverse. I thought it might be fun just to touch on some of the familiar, the gray whales I mentioned are actively migrating up our coast right now. They're hugging, right now, the, the mothers and calves are, are going up from Baja up into Alaska, and they're going to stay really close to the shore. They're trying to avoid killer whales because killer whales will eat their babies if they have the chance. They make a variety of sounds, but here's just one sound that you might hear. It's a low sort of grumble, almost like a burp sound coming from the gray whale. Now, one of the more common whales, and oftentimes a star of the show, are humpback whales. Um, they are often very ac acrobatic at the surface. They're really well known for their songs and a variety of sounds that they make. Um, 
and so here I want to play a recording of humpback whales that uh, I recorded right near Cordell Bank. So I have blue whales, and so the minke whale. The minke whale is uh, a whale that's the most abundant whale in the world. There are more minke whales than any other whale, but we know hardly anything about them. Um, this is a sound that we know is associated with breeding, but we don't really know much more about the sounds that they make. So here's a, and it's a really weird sound. So the last example is a, a example of human sounds. These are explosives that are used in fisheries called seal bombs. And I know that they're commonly used in, around Monterey Bay to deter sea lions from preying on uh, the catch of, in the squid fishery. But I was surprised to hear these in the sanctuary as well. So here are some seal bombs from around Cordell Bay. And Simonis, what a totally fascinating subject and talk. We'll want to learn more about this as your research advances. And thank you very much for being our guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure to be here. Yeah, like I like to say, you can learn a lot by listening. presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.